From Sarasota Memorial, this is HealthCast. A healthy dose of information from experts you can trust. Hi, everybody. Welcome to HealthCast. I'm Heidi Godman. In this episode, we're going to be talking about bariatric surgery, which helps people lose weight by changing their digestive system. In particular today, we'll find out about candidates for bariatric surgery, also the different types of procedures that are available and the risks and benefits, and lifestyle changes that are necessary after surgery to control your weight. Our guest is Dr. Arun Rao, a bariatric surgeon and medical director of Sarasota Memorial's Bariatric and Metabolic Health Center. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Heidi. Thanks for having me. So this is really kind of a drastic procedure for some people to go through. Maybe part of their stomach will be made a little bit smaller or their changes to the small intestine. Why would someone go to that drastic a measure? Well, I think we're starting to see the effects of obesity are becoming more and more of a problem in the United States. And, you know, I I think the misconception is that this is the easy way out that, you know, oh, I just had this done. And now all of a sudden, I'm going to get into this slender body and be healthy. Well, the fact of the matter is most of these patients that come into my office have extensive health issues that are related to their obesity. And so, you know, when we start talking about these things, and patients do get very nervous and fearful of undergoing surgery to fix this issue. You know, I point out the fact that we're talking about saving your life and making your life longer. And in our patient population, we see that life expectancy increases anywhere from 10 to 15 years. Not only that, but we see an improvement in the quality of life by about 95%. So, I mean, that alone would make someone want to do it, but why not lose weight? Why not try and exercise, diet, et cetera? For some people, that doesn't work. That's correct. And, you know, 80% of my clientele are women. I think that as women get older and um, start to, you know, kind of go through changes, especially when it comes to a hormonal uh, standpoint, it makes it much more difficult. We have fat that's very resistant. um, And not only that, but, you know, we are bombarded by a lot of food that I think has chemicals that can actually make us want more of those food types that are actually not good for us and cause weight gain. Right. Studies on artificial sweeteners showing that kind of reaction. So who is a really good candidate for bariatric surgery? It can't be just a little bit of weight. No. Um, And in fact, you know, because I feel strongly about what we do at our center and because I feel that surgery isn't okay for everyone, even if you do qualify according to national standards, I don't believe that everyone is a good candidate. I've created two separate programs that kind of work in conjunction with one another. So we have a bariatric surgery group and we have a metabolic kind of weight loss program because I want to make sure we offer people feasible options that they feel comfortable with. And you're right, not everybody is going to qualify from even a number standpoint. So insurance and the ASMBS, which is the governing body for bariatric surgery, they have criteria for patients who qualify. Um, And we base this off of a body mass index and body mass index is calculated with height as well as weight. Um, And it's kind of a complex Uh, calculation, but you could actually pull that up on the internet very easily and put in your height and weight and it'll calculate it for you. At a BMI of 35, um, a patient can qualify for bariatric surgery. Now, a lot of the insurance companies that cover will say that the patient will need anywhere from one to two comorbid conditions. And each insurance company has a different idea of what a comorbid condition can be. Most of them consider diabetes an obvious one. Um, But things like osteoarthritis, fatty liver disease, um, high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, those are some of the other ones that kind of fall under that category. Now, at a BMI of 40, we have a number of insurance companies that actually feel like they are willing to cover that procedure without a comorbid condition, but a number will still require at least one to two comorbid conditions to qualify. According to ASMBS, if a patient wants to pay out of pocket, they will cover uh, or they recommend bariatric surgery for patients with a BMI of 30 to 35, as long as there is a comorbid condition included. Since we're talking about that out-of-pocket aspect, how much is it? So, you know, across the country, these rates actually vary quite a bit. Here in the state of Florida, I'd say the average rate for a gastric sleeve is somewhere between fourteen dollars to $20,000. And for a gastric bypass, it's somewhere between probably nineteen dollars to $25,000, $26,000. All right. And those are the different types of procedures we could do. We'll talk about those in one second. But so a candidate might have to be determined by his or her BMI 
MI, whether the insurance is covering it or not. Anything else? Uh, those are the big ones. But of course, you know, we want to make sure from a psychological standpoint that patients are ready to undergo the procedure. And also, we want to make sure that from a health standpoint, it makes sense. So the risk to benefit ratio needs to be in favor of surgery. And I have, you know, certainly turned away 50 something year olds with things in their history that make me think that the risk to benefit ratio is not in their favor. And then I've taken patients close to 80 years of age. And we actually have a patient right now who's over 80, who's relatively healthy in relation to what's going on and could truly benefit and have a better life afterwards. So it's it's not an age number type of game. It is certainly more of a, what does this patient look like from a health standpoint, as well as what do they look like from a be- risk to benefit ratio scenario. And you don't want to rush into this. And so you have a program with a lot of different components to help someone prepare. Tell us about that. Yeah. I, you know, the one thing is initially early on in my career, I felt like a lot of times the insurance companies were just putting this time in front of patients to hopefully dissuade them from proceeding to surgery. Now I value that time a lot more. I think that preparing for this journey ahead of time makes all the difference in the world. Really getting a patient to understand that there's no magic here, that this is really going to be hard hard work, that they're undertaking something pretty extensive to be able to live a better life. And the benefits are incredible, but they have to make sure that they're totally invested in the process. And so I really do use that time to get them ready. Expectations before surgery, during surgery, after surgery, even five to 10 years down the road, what that might look like, making sure that they've even prepared their kitchens and their homes and their families. Because when you have a number of children in your house or you live with people who don't have to worry about what they eat, it makes it so much more difficult to be compliant, especially long term. And you have counseling, you have support groups, you have education, different classes, right? Absolutely. I, you know, I think it's important to treat obesity as, as what it is. And I think it is a form of addiction. And if you don't have the right pieces in place, then the actual success for these procedures is short lived. And whether that's two years, three years, five or seven years out, I mean, I want to make sure that you have done this for a good reason and really glean as much as possible from the process and making sure that this is lifelong success. Tell us about the specific procedures. There's the bypass that is done quite a bit and also the gastric sleeve. What's the difference? So with the gastric sleeve, we it's very much a restrictive procedure. We go in and we actually take down connections to the lateral aspect of the stomach. We use a measuring device placed into the stomach and we use a stapler to essentially go alongside of the measuring device to create a much smaller stomach. Now you may think, okay, so that decreases the size of the stomach. So of course the patient's going to eat less, but there's actually a neurohormonal influence that also takes place during the procedure. When we remove that portion of the stomach, and we do remove it entirely, it actually has cells that secrete the neurohormone ghrelin. And the neurohormone ghrelin actually causes hunger. So a lot of our patients don't have the same level of hunger. Some of them don't have hunger at all. And sometimes that can prove to be difficult too, because I have to convince somebody who's been told their whole life they eat too much, that if they don't eat, they're not going to lose the weight. And there's so many other cells that line the stomach. I mean, the parietal cells producing acid or maybe intrinsic factor so you can absorb uh, vitamin B12. When you're losing that part of the stomach, you're losing those too. Well, so the parietal cells, the acid production is still there. And one of the things we really are very cognizant about, at least I am very cognizant about, is the increased risk for reflux, gastroesophageal reflux disease after a sleeve gastrectomy, because acid is still produced. And the shape of the stomach and the design of the anatomy now actually puts patients at a higher risk for reflux. Um, Additionally, I do, we do recognize the intrinsic factor component, because that is far more into the antrum, and we do take a portion of the antrum. So we certainly make sure that these patients are equipped with the right multivitamins, and that we're checking those levels, and that they understand that multivitamins will be a lifelong thing. It's not something that once they lose their weight and they feel good and they are happy where they're at, that they can just stop taking those medications. But when you are stapling the stomach, then you remove the other portion. You can't unstaple it. That's correct. So this procedure is one of the procedures that is not reversible. Once this is done, it's done. We can't go back in and change that. Okay, so that is the sleeve. And tell us about the bypass. So the gastric bypass combines um, a restrictive procedure along with a malabsorptive aspect. And so we go in and we create a very small type of stomach and the measurements on my pouches and everybody's going to be a little all the surgeons are going to have their own little tweaks on this but my stomachs are about six inches or i'm sorry six centimeters in length and about two to three centimeters in width Um, and then i count down 
the small intestine, the jejunum in, in particular, by about 50 centimeters. I actually transect the intestine at that spot and I move the distal end and connect it to the pouch and use the proximal end and to connect it further down. So in essence, the patient eats smaller quantities and the body actually absorbs less than what they're consuming. So you get this fantastic combination of restriction as well as malabsorption. It's very, very vital that these patients are well equipped from a nutritional standpoint because this does mean that you're not going to absorb things in the way you did before. And so we need to make sure we're supplementing things accordingly. And we should point out too that the small intestine, that's where most of our nutrient absorption is occurring. That's correct. All right. So other risks. So maybe there's malabsorption, but what about other risks with the bypass? Because that seems even more invasive almost than than the sleeve. And, you know, we are certainly rerouting things. We are actually uh, changing the small intestine and how that goes. And there are, there are certainly increased risks in malabsorption and there's increased risks of potential during surgery bleeding and things like that. We have potential for leaks that can occur with either procedure. Um, and on occasion, we have issues with hernias through the actual space where we've operated. Um, but by and large, as long as the patient continues to follow up and make sure that they understand that the journey that they take is a lifelong one, even with my office and with me and with the people that support them or the program that they choose to go with, then usually we avoid and we are able to sidestep a lot of these issues. What about the ring? Is that what they called it? They used to be so popular. Yes. And now it's not. The gastric band. Yes. Yes. And, um, you know, in for a long time, that was the procedure of choice. But currently, it's only about 5 to 8, five to 6% of procedures that are performed in the United States. And I would say that a number of my patients are revisional procedures. Now, I got to be honest, I think that the adjustable gastric band can work, but the problem that we run into as surgeons is we're not sure what makes a successful patient with this device and what doesn't. Nobody's really been able to elucidate why some patients can make it work and a number of patients can't. So if you're going to have it today, you would probably have the sleeve or the bypass. That would be my recommendation simply because I don't like putting patients under the risk of surgery without giving them a really good tool. All um, right. And then, and then when you have that surgery, things change a lot. It's going to change how you eat. It's also going to change the way you digest food. And, and sometimes it's not pleasant, right? That's correct. And, you know, with the gastric bypass, we can encounter issues with dumping. And uh, dumping is essentially very unpleasant symptoms of nausea, vomiting, sweating, faintness, even diarrhea, potentially. Um, and usually we see that with a high carbo carbohydrate meal, or even a high sugar meal. Um, and in those instances, it's kind of a bad side effect, but in a weird way, it can sometimes be a good thing because sugar is bad. And we know that uh, a large part of the problem that we have here in the United States is that we have a little bit of an addiction to sugar. And so if you have a bad reaction to sugar every time you have it, there's a good chance you're not going to have it as often. So I do find that on a number of occasions, patients who actually end up with dumping tend to stay on track a little bit better because their body kind of fights back. Um, unfortunately, I can't tell you who will or won't have it. How, how long does it take before the body realizes there's been this change, we need to adjust, and then how long before your digestion becomes a little more normal to you? So I think that's a patient to patient situation. And it's certainly also a compliance situation as well. I think that we encounter, even though we prepare our patients extremely well, I think we still encounter people who think they're gonna find a way around it. And early on, that's just not gonna happen. Um, we see in gastric bypass patients that about 30% of patients will gain their weight back. And early on, patients sit there astounded as to how that can happen. But compliance is the key to all of this. And really learning your new anatomy and how it best serves you and how you can best serve it is a big key to all of that. So I would say the digestion part of that is going to be very dependent upon the patient themselves. And sometimes we find patients who weren't lactose you know, it didn't have issues with lactose before are now starting to have issues with lactose. And so we identify some of the foods that maybe work better for them and some that they maybe need to sidestep at least temporarily to see if we can't improve the reaction down the road. But there are really some great benefits, you know, for, for some people, they can lose a lot of weight. What's a typical amount of weight that they lose? And, and you're saying that only 30% or in 30% of the cases, they might gain it back. 
But what about the 70%? How much are they losing? Oh, it can be absolutely astounding. Um, you know, I had a patient who uh, insurance didn't want to cover, and I lost him to follow up, and he showed up nine months later, 88 pounds lighter, for a total of 145 pounds lighter because it works. And he, when I talked to him about what he had done, essentially he did everything we spoke about preoperatively, and he did amazing. The thing is, again, there's no magic to this. And the key is to make sure you use that first year to train yourself so that in the next years that follow, you feel like you're doing something wrong if you go off the track. How, how quickly should you be losing the weight? Like a couple of pounds a week, a month? What? So I think it's very dependent upon the patient. And I always tell people, make sure that you're looking at the percentage of your body weight lost. Because if a patient comes in with a BMI of 35, they can't expect to lose 20 pounds in a month. But if I have a patient who's, say, 400 pounds and you know is losing weight, I've seen patients walk in with a 20-pound weight loss in 10 days. I mean, it can just be that significant. Is it safe? It is safe because, of course, we're monitoring, especially in that first year, monitoring the everything that's going on from protein levels to even vitamin levels to make sure that this is a safe and effective weight loss because, obviously, we don't want to give you something like osteoporosis in exchange for better health in other aspects. So. And then how does that affect bad knees, diabetes, I mean, all of these other comorbidities that suddenly seem to be a little bit different. Yeah. So with diabetes, especially with the gastric bypass, we know for a fact 40 to 45% of patients are going to get complete remission of their diabetes. It's astounding. Um, and then in about 40 to 45%, we see another scoop of patients who's, they're essentially going into a much improved aspect with their diabetes. They're coming off the insulin, which by the way, insulin causes weight gain. So it, it's kind of a vicious cycle. Um, we do have 10 to 12% of patients who will never get that improvement or remission. But when you look at those patients, they've been on insulin for years and multiple medications to try and control that. And I think the takeaway there is don't wait for your diabetes to get so bad that we can't help to reverse some of those things with this procedure. Any patient who has di type 2 diabetes needs to really consider going down this road, especially early on. As, as soon as you start to hear those words come out of your primary care doctor, you need to start thinking about this. And of course, not everyone who has type 2 diabetes is overweight. Uh, Tom Hanks comes to mind, right? And the actor Tom Hanks. So are doctors starting to talk about this procedure possibly down the road as something someone might elect to do, even if he or she isn't overweight, because of type 2 diabetes? I think that that is something that has been going on in, in the college for a while. We've been talking about that for a while, and we do see improvements. Um, there is something that happens with our pancreas once we reroute things. The, the triggers that set it off, there's almost a sensitivity that improves. Um, and I, a lot of these studies are going on in other countries, and they are seeing success. The problem is... I think the insurance companies are not really wanting to cover these procedures uh, for that patient population. I think the data is going to have to be very, very well written out, thought out in order to maybe go down that road. But I think it's a road that we need to consider. So really could be a lot of benefits, whether it's putting type 2 diabetes in remission potentially or losing a lot of weight and keeping that particular new body shape really does take a lot of work. You were alluding to lifestyle change before. So you've got to eat differently and you help with that. Yes. Your, your program helps with that. And exercise. Oh, yes. Can people make that change? They, you know, it's astounding because I have patients and this is the thing. I think I think the misconception and especially in Sarasota, our patient population is definitely older than the, the national average, I would say. And the things that people brag to me about are things like being able to cross their legs again, wanting to play with their grandkids and take them to Disney or, to, you know, take them to one of the theme parks without having to go around in a scooter. And yes, the, I mean, outside of the medical aspects, being comfortable, being able to put a seatbelt on without an extender, being able to go on trips because nobody's sitting there making you buy two seats. And it's just a different world. These patients become world travelers. We had a patient who came in because he wanted a lung transplant and they said, your weight's too high. You won't qualify. He came in. We were able to do his procedure. Not only does he not qualify anymore, he doesn't use oxygen anymore. And it's, you know, he's 
talking about going to walk the Great Wall of China. It really is about giving people back life that they had never experienced before in a lot of instances that they had experienced before, but they missed a lot. But part of that has to be a psychological approach. Tell us how that plays a part. So I honestly think that the biggest piece of this journey and the biggest piece that most people miss is the psychological aspects. This changed so much about who you are as a person. And I find that a lot of times they we're not preparing patients for that. Now I'll say a lot of times we use food as coping mechanisms. And I see that a lot. People, you know, when they're stressed, when they're upset, when they're angry, they use food. Now, if I go in and I take away your one main coping mechanism, what are you going to do? And people don't think about that because they don't realize what a crutch food can sometimes be. So that's just one small aspect of the psychological battle that I see my patients face on the regular. Sometimes it's friends and family who judge them for even going through with the procedure. Sometimes it's even their own insight where I have patients who still feel as big as they were when they started when they have shrunk down to this amazing healthier weight. And so I find that the psychological piece of this is often ignored and I emphasize it quite a bit. It's just for some reason when we treat mental health, it's it doesn't qualify the way a broken arm or a broken leg would. The stigma. Oh yeah. Right. But but is that something that you guide patients toward? Are they doing that? And then how does that help? Oh, it's you know I got to tell you I've had patients in my office who. It, I made them go through a full year before they went to surgery because I saw that without the psychological component that they would crash and burn essentially. And so what I, you know, these patients that went through counseling, if you ask them if it was the surgery or it was the counseling, they'd point to the counseling as being a bigger effect on their success than the actual surgery. Should you just do the counseling and, and you don't need the surgery? I wish everybody started with the counseling because the counseling is such an important adjunct. And if you come into it mentally ready to make changes, then yeah, I mean, I think that if you need the surgery, we're here to do that, but I want you to be healthy. My whole goal as a surgeon, as a physician, is to make you healthier. And a lot of times that health starts in the brain. It doesn't really start in the body. So I really do push for that. And I have kept patients from surgery because I felt like they needed that more than they needed me. And the big picture, the whole of the person winds up being better. Oh, by far. And they're well adjusted and they know how to cope. And I, I don't know about you, but for me, life just gets more chaotic. So I want to make sure I equip them appropriately. And then they're happy. Oh, so much happier. Dr. Arun Rao, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, time now for today's takeaways. One is that bariatric surgery isn't really something you should rush into. It takes careful assessment and then a lifetime of maintenance. Two is that bariatric surgery can help you lose weight and maybe even put some health conditions like type 2 diabetes into remission. And three, for more information about Sarasota Memorial's bariatric program, call 941-917-7777. Thank you for joining us today. For more information, please visit smh.com. Follow us on your favorite social media network.